right, welcome to AquaZen Exotic Aquatics. We've got a lot to talk about today and I'm gonna break it all down. Last time we discussed wild caught fish and ethics concerning taking tropical freshwater fish out of their natural habitat and distributing them to captivity. Tonight, we're gonna dive into all aspects of hybrid fish and everything you need to consider to make up your mind. We've all heard of African cichlids that primarily come from the lakes in Africa's Great Rift Valley. We're also familiar with South American cichlids like rams or geophagus. You might not be familiar with American cichlids. Unlike other cichlids that are found naturally in freshwater lakes in their country of origin, American cichlids are found nowhere in nature, in fact, and are 100% aquarium bred. We have started to see an increasing number of variety to choose from in recent times. Please keep in mind we aren't talking about genetically modified fish, although this will come up briefly when we discuss a certain variant of American cichlid later on. Um, a good example of genetically modified fish would be the absolute abomination coming out of the Glowfish Labs. I can't take too hard of a stance against them though because upon further research by myself and other fish keepers on YouTube it appears that the fish aren't harmed in the process allegedly these fish can be bred and just pass on the vibrant glowing ability naturally. Uh, I'll make a, another episode evaluating the ethics of genetically modified fish in a future video, but for now, we're discussing solely hybrid freshwater fish. So, what do we mean exactly when we say hybrid? Well, hybridization is the crossing of two distinct species to produce offspring with mixed genetic traits. We've seen this become more of a common practice in the aquarium trade. While hybrid fish often possess unique characteristics and aesthetic appeal, their presence raises several concerns, right? Let's really examine the advantages and disadvantages of hybrid fish, uh, considering factors such as genetic integrity, possible implications, and the welfare of the fish in general. Are hybridized fish a good thing for the hobby? Well, the answer may not be so black and white. Let's start with the advantages. So, number one, aesthetic appeal. Hybrid fish often exhibit striking colors, uh, patterns, and intentionally selected features that cannot be commonly found in otherwise naturally occurring tropical fish. This aesthetic diversity adds visual interest to aquarium displays and attracts hobbyists seeking unique and eye-catching specimens. Number two, disease resistance. In some cases, hybridization can result in offspring with enhanced disease resistance or resilience to environmental stressors. Um, practicing a selective breeding process in which only the strongest and certain trait bearing individuals are distributed and allowed to breed will ensure resilience to threats such as diseases and other problems that may threaten a uh, certain percentage of the population. Number three, scientific value. So studying hybrid fish can provide valuable insights into evolutionary processes, genetic inheritance, and species interactions. Their presence in aquariums can spark curiosity and promote awareness of biodiversity conservation amongst hobbyists and the general public, um, similar to how Glowfish can justify selling the neon fish. This this practice seems undoubtedly uh, unethical, but it can also be argued that this can instill a love for fish and children at a uh, at a young age, right? Um, so let's get a real world example of this: the blue polar parrot cichlid. It, it seems to be a success story in this regard. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful fish. It's a combination of a uh, convict cichlid. Uh, otherwise known as a zebra cichlid, which is native to Central America, and a parrotfish cichlid, typically of platinum variety, but some examples of blood oranges have been successfully documented. Um, the parrotfish is also a hybrid itself. It's a combination between, <laughs> get ready for this, a severum and a red devil. Um, and it definitely shows. I have a full-size one in my African clawed frog tank. They have a very strange personality and I, I struggled for a while to find the right tank to put them in. When I put them in the 75 with the big boys including a full-sized albino thread finicara 
and a smaller Senegal biker, he allowed himself to be easily bullied. But when I moved him to a different tank with more peaceful fish, he would relentlessly chase them around and become the bully himself. I ran into this problem again when I put him into my frog tank. Once I added some convict cichlids to keep him in check, the tank has been much more peaceful and he leaves the frogs alone. So with that in mind, one may assume that the blue polar parrot would be temperamental and probably unsuitable for community tanks, but actually the opposite is true. I, I have several uh, polar parrots in community tanks. Uh, with a variety of co-inhabitants ranging from tetras, bristlenose plecos, corridoras, pea puffers, a male beta, etc. And they don't tend to display any aggression until they pair off with a mate and begin the breeding process. Um, you know, usually once this happens, your polar parrot uh, pair will section off a corner of the tank and simply chase off anyone who gets too close. But it's important to note that they do not relentlessly hunt other fish down. They only protect the area that they've chosen to spawn in. These fish are extremely intelligent. Um, they not only guard their eggs, but they also look after their young uh, until they're old enough to fend for themselves. Polar parrots are extremely good parents to their young, uh, and they're actually they're fairly easy to breed if your tank is set up uh, in a certain way to promote it. Um, these guys also, they can recognize their owners, um, believe it or not, uh, sort of similar to uh, axolotls. You'll see them greet you at the top of the tank as you approach, saying hi, or just, uh, <laughs> I suppose, to demand food. Um, but where do they fit into all this? Well, in a time of economic uncertainty and increased living costs, many fish keepers may be renting. Um, as far as their living situation goes or not have the financial means to set up and maintain a large enough tank suitable for most types of cichlids. Um, so the polar parrot, typically topping out at three to four inches, provides individuals with that large cichlid personality yet easily contained in a smaller tank. And if you're familiar with cichlids, you probably already understand the concept of overstocking to mitigate aggression. This is why you can't have most cichlids in a community tank, not just because of their size, but the aggressive nature of the fish. Most cichlid tanks must be species only in a, in a large size and include heavy filtration to compensate for the necessary overstocking, uh, where you know a breeding pair of polar pairs can easily be kept in a 20 gallon, but you know I would say consider upgrading to a 30 as the pair increases in size uh, and maturity. Um, I will be making another video specifically on polar parrot tank setups, whether it's for breeding or you are wanting to set up, uh, you know, your community tank correctly before just throwing them in. Uh, as I mentioned before, they, they typically are peaceful, but being technically a cichlid, there are certain things you can do in a community tank to ensure success. I, I actually, myself, I got a pair to successfully breed in one of my community tanks. Uh, it's a 30 gallon and it uh, has other small predators and we haven't lost a single fry yet. Um, so be watching for that video because I am going to have tons of good tips on how you can do this uh, as well. Um, so anyway, so hybrid fish, they seem great, right? Well, not exactly. Let's get into a little bit of the darker side. So first and foremost, um, genetic integrity. Hybridization can tend to blur the boundaries between species and create deformities, uh, sometimes resulting in an almost unlivable existence for the fish. Intentional or accidental release of hybrid fish into natural habitats can also lead to genetic pollution and disrupt local ecosystems by diluting the gene pool of native species in the case that they are able to spawn um, and crossbreed. So number two, Conservation concerns. Hybridization poses a risk to the conservation of endangered or threatened species. Um, this is because it potentially diverts attention and resources away from conservation efforts aimed at protecting wild populations and their habitats. You know, in other words, why put resources and awareness into saving the Amazon River when cattle is profitable business, just like creating new, better looking, flashier fish in a laboratory from jellyfish DNA? 
Number three, the additional ethical considerations. The breeding and sale of hybrid fish raises ethical questions regarding the welfare of the animals involved, right? More specific regulations regarding the specific practice of breeding or creating hybrids has to be put in place before we can accept this as a general good practice. Some hybrids, uh, they may inherit genetic defects or health issues from their parent species as stated earlier and we cannot depend on every breeder and every lab to do the right thing and not distribute unhealthy abominable fish but who would do such a thing you may ask and unfortunately i have an answer for you you remember the aforementioned parrotfish we often see them in the blood orange variety and sometimes even the platinum kinds if we're lucky but have you ever seen the tattooed jelly bean parrotfish? The name does not deceive you. These fish undergo an extremely inhumane process uh, and literally uh, they are tattooed with whatever design the company operating the lab believes will attract new fish keepers uh, who typically are not even privy to the terrible acts being committed. Increased regulation w would be a great step to take as it would, you know, disrupt the current market of modified and hybridized fish, but it wouldn't be a fix-all solution. For example, most of these tattooed fish, they come from overseas Asian countries, but banning the ability to import these sort of fish would be an example of taking the necessary steps to preserve the health and well-being of freshwater species. Another good example of this would be those bubble-eyed goldfish um, that you can find anywhere at, at any pet store. It's, it's a huge mess. The large bubbles on each side of their face decrease eyesight, swim ability, and they can easily get caught on driftwood, rocks, uh, or get sucked into the filter. So the bottom line is this. The, the presence of hybrid fish in the aquarium trade presents a extremely complex and nuanced issue with both advantages and disadvantages as we've seen so i'm extremely split myself on the topic as i've completely fallen in love with the polar pair cichlids but not all hybrids end up uh, so lucky as we've seen hybridization can result in visually stunning specimens and opens up otherwise impossible opportunities but we can't forget that it also poses a risk to genetic integrity, conservation efforts, general welfare of the fish involved. Therefore, careful consideration and responsible practices are going to be essential if we can truly accept this practice in the aquarium trade. By promoting ethical breeding, genetic transparency, and conservation-minded decision-making, I think we can strive to balance the appeal of hybrid fish with the preservation of biodiversity and the welfare of our aquatic ecosystems. My name's Darren, and if you ever had a bristlenose pletho, eat every Amazon sword in your tank and it's bullshit because you spent $40 on them. Let me know in the comments. Until next time.